Children's hospitals recently advised parents to bring toys and blankets to help their children deal with the much longer wait times. Several rural emergency rooms shut down, sometimes for weeks at a time. And hospital ICUs everywhere brace for the surge of flu season coupled with the ongoing pandemic. With us now on the incredible stress on the province's ERs and hospital capacity in Perth, Ontario, Dr. Alan Drummond, emergency physician at Great War Memorial Hospital and co-chair of public affairs at the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians. And here in our studio, Dr. Carolyn Snyder, medical director of emergency medicine at St. Michael's Hospital. Hi to you both. Hi. Uh, so Hi. since I've had, um, I had COVID in the summer and since I had it, my breath, I lose my breath a lot. So I'm glad I got through the introduction. Yes. Um, and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to speak to us about what's happening in hospitals. Before we start the discussion, we had uh, Catherine Smart, former president of the Canadian Medical Association. Uh, she was on this program this past June discussing the crisis in Ontario's healthcare system. Here's what she had to say then. I think that's why you're, you're hearing many of us in the system use words like collapsing, is this is our fear. You know, already we're overwhelmed. You're not being alarmist. I don't think so. I really, I really don't. And, and it's for this exact reason, you know, these issues around staffing, retention, access, in the past have been largely restricted to sort of rural areas, places where it was harder to retain people. Now we're seeing it across the country. There's no province that doesn't have this issue. We're seeing it in major cities. We are seeing major hospitals on diversion because of lack of staff. We're hearing about emergency department closures in urban centers, as you've said. And that's right now. We know that fall will be worse. Uh, so, Alan, I wanted to start with you. Um, I think when we were having that discussion, we were talking about the language around what was happening in healthcare or hospitals on the verge of collapse. Uh, this past June, we had that conversation. We're in the middle of fall, as Dr. Smart mentioned. This fall might look different, and it's looking a different way than it did in June. Are the problems in our healthcare system worse now than they were this past summer? Yes. Um, we've had an, un uh, an unprecedented uh, summer in Ontario with uh, about 17 or 18 uh, rural emergency departments closing for an extended period of time, including my own in Perth, which was closed for three weeks during the busiest part of our our, uh, our season with cottage country and so forth. Uh, we even had uh, the Montfort and Eastern uh, Ottawa uh, closed uh, because of staffing shortages. In addition to that, we have in our urban departments uh, really unconscionable waits for care with lots of patients uh, being stuck in the emergency department waiting for a bed to become available. Uh, even in my own, uh, we've had patients admitted uh, and stayed in our emergency department for two or three days waiting for a bed. So our healthcare system is vulnerable. And the problem is that uh, potentially we may be in big trouble this year. We're already seeing the effects of uh, RSV with children and a lot of pediatric care is delivered at the community hospital level. Uh, we also have variants of COVID. We may well be uh, coupled with uh, influenza resurgence this year. Uh, and we have a community which, uh, with government enthusiasm perhaps, uh, believes that the, the pandemic is over and it's okay now to forego all the public health measures uh, that have been in place. And so it really may well be the perfect storm of a vulnerable healthcare system overwhelmed by the twin twindemic of influenza and COVID. Uh, and with a public which is not uh, fully immunized and not embracing public health measures. So I, I am deeply concerned. Um, you mentioned uh, ER closures. I want to come back to that in a moment. But Carolyn, um, Alan mentioned uh, how the healthcare system is vulnerable in the summer. Dr. Smart, we were talking about it collapsing. You work at a busy hospital in downtown Toronto. How difficult is it to keep up with the demand right now? Well, uh, our, our resources don't meet the demand in our system, and it's really important to think about <coughs> hospital wait times and emergency department wait times within the larger system, from the care prior to coming to the emergency department, all the way through to caring for people who need long-term care. None of those resources right now are matching the demand of our system. 
What do you mean by before? Like, you mean when someone gets into, like, a, an ambulance or...? Or even uh, that we have amazing family physicians, many of them working extremely hard, but there's just not enough of them, and there's not enough uh, primary care resources from the start. And so some of that spills over to, to needing emergency care, whether it's because there's nowhere else to go or because of the prolonged waits to get that kind of preliminary or preventive care prior, and therefore people coming in sicker. And then when people come into our emergency departments, we we uh, are really, all of our emergency departments in, in, in Ontario are, are struggling with staffing. And, and it's not just emergency departments, it's all the way through the hospital. It's all the way through long-term care, home care, complex continuing care. And so it becomes a real, really difficult for us to, to manage the day-to-day -day individual patients when the entire system isn't matching the demand, the, the resources to the demand. So basically, it's, it, this uh, issue is bigger than just what happens in ERs. Yes. Uh, we're just the canary in the coal mine. We really are. Uh, Alan mentioned that people are waiting to be seen uh, for two to three days, which just sounds kind of, you know, unimaginable because if you go to ER, you're seeking immediate immediate help. Uh, when people come to your ER, what are patients coming in for? So uh, I would say, I would probably correct, I think that people are waiting two or three days once they've been admitted to a bed upstairs. So it's not, uh, I think the average number is over 30 hours. I think it's closer to 35 hours people are waiting once admitted. That's a day to go. And, and a bit, right? Uh, and, and it's not uncommon to have people waiting many more days uh, in order to get to a bed that provides the resources they need. Uh, and so what's happening when people come into our emergency department is that we as physicians and nurses and our entire healthcare team don't have places to see those patients that are arriving at our doorstep. And so we're shuffling around within our emergency department. We may only have two or three beds of our 36 beds at one point, which we can see patients in. And so we're bringing them in and then we're moving them to a seat. Uh, and, and so what I, what I do need to say is that, um, like in our emergency department, 40% of our patients are, are uh, classified as CTAS 1 or 2, which means they're a resuscitation or they're uh, um, or their uh, heart attack that uh, is, do, like doesn't need CPR. Those people are being seen quickly, but at the expense of not being able to see the patient that may come in with abdomen pain that could be appendicitis. Mm -hmm. And so th that's, those are the people that need to be in our emergency department and we can't serve them as quickly as they deserve to be seen and that all Ontarios deserved. And so the reason is because we don't have the space within our emergency departments because patients don't have space upstairs. I mean, hospitals don't have space upstairs for the patients waiting. And the reason hospitals don't have space is because there's a huge proportion of people that need long-term care and there's no long-term care beds for them or and they're not in the right place. And the conundrum there is we know that long-term care is, is also not staffed very well. And so we're really, it, it's, a, it's a desperate situation in healthcare right now. Um, Alan, Carolyn uh, used this uh, term, uh, ERs are the canary in the coal mine. Your ER closed temporarily, and I can imagine um, if you get to that point, a lot of things have to be considered. Uh, can you tell us why the ER closed? Yeah, um, it was uh, uh, publicly posed that we were a uh, victim of uh, COVID. The reality is, however, is that there's been uh, disrespect uh, of our nursing staffs, both uh, locally and provincially, and in fact, nationally. Um, uh, and uh, we had 15 nurses uh, in the fall of last year um and uh we dropped that number from 15 to 7 over the course of 6 months with nurses saying you know what we're tired of the moral injury and the burnout we're tired of the, the pervasive violence we see uh in the emergency departments uh we're tired of the disrespect we are unable to provide the the level of safe care uh that our patients deserve and we're afraid that if we continue in this system uh that there's going to be a medical error and an unnecessary death so many left we went from 15 to seven, and then suddenly we went from seven to five because of further, further desire to uh, find, a, you know, basically a more respectful job. And then we had uh, of the remaining five patients, uh, nurses, to develop COVID. And we went down to three, so it was posed as a, a as yet yeah, another sort of sad reflection of a very bad pandemic. But the reality of it is. Uh, a failure to address nursing concerns with respect to the ability to provide optimal and safe patient care, uh, forcing our nurses to leave. And that is in fact reflective uh, of, I think every other sort of emergency department uh, in, in this province. It's not about the money. 
is all about, you know, after 20 years of begging uh, to provide us optimal uh, resources to provide safe patient care, we realize it's not coming. We're just cogs in the wheel and really nobody seems to care very much about the quality of care we deliver. So, so people are basically voting with their feet. Um, you, I want to do a really quick uh, follow up with that. You said that the nurses left because of disrespect. What do you mean by that? So uh, nurses primarily, this is not a monetary issue. Uh, so nurses primarily want to be able to provide safe care. Uh, and in a crowded emergency department, whether it's boarded patients, admitted patients waiting for bed to become available, an inability to see patients in a waiting room because all our stretchers are occupied by by admitted elderly patients, where uh, ambulances are uh, are unable uh, to offload their patients, and so they're waiting in hallways. Uh, you know, and the demand for you know, let's get beds available so we can transfer patients to the wards. Let's make sure we have an optimal staffing ratio for nurses per patient. Let's let's just give us the ability to do the job properly. Uh, and those concerns are largely ignored with a sort of a pat on the back, a cookie during nursing week and just do your best. But doing we can't do our best under the present circumstances. Uh, and, and nurses, frankly, uh, uh, are feeling quite demoralized and saying, um, I, I just can't do this anymore. It's it's just uh, I, I'm burnt out and 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 I feel that we're not providing safe care. Well, well, Alan, um, when an ER in a rural community closes temporarily, what effect does that have on the system as a whole? Well, it has a major effect. Certainly, it has an effect on the community. I mean, we were closed for three solid weeks during uh, our optimal, uh, or at least our busiest season of the year, with cottagers, uh, campers, people in transit, on vacations, music festivals. Um, and, you know, it's only by the grace of God that we did not have a death uh, in, in our community and a necessary death because our emergency department doors were closed. Um, there's a domino effect uh, when an emergency department closes, uh, other hospitals in the region get busier. In our particular case, it was our sister hospital, our sister site, Smith Falls, uh, having to see the patients from Perth and beyond, and they were frankly overwhelmed. The wait times were frankly unconscionable and unacceptable. Um, and you know that wasn't that was just not just one hospital, but all the other hospitals in our region had to pick up the slack uh, because we were closed. Carolyn, has your ER had to close? We've never had to close our entire uh, emergency department. Fortunately, there are times where, in order to provide the safest care, we will close some beds within the emergency department. That's common across uh, most hospitals now in in all large cities in Ontario. Uh, but fortunately, we haven't. Uh, but but uh, we are often working at levels that are unconscionable, unconscionable, sorry. Uh, and uh, and uh, it, I, Alan talks about the moral injury. Mm -hmm. It is, none of us got into medicine really necessarily for the pay, although uh, I, I actually would disagree. I think that uh, our, our nurses are extremely undervalued and when they see um, uh, a government uh, saying we're only going to raise 1% per year at a time of inflation of 11%, during a time where they put themselves and their families at incredible risk, the, the last four years have been terrifying for us as healthcare workers and, um, and extremely risky. And so uh, to feel that moral injury of not being able to provide the kind of care that we were taught to, to give and that our, 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 our fellow citizens in Ontario deserve to have uh, is, uh, is, ex is awful. It hits everybody. We walk, we go home every night upset about not being able to give the kind of care we believe we should. And then to feel unvalued, and I see that in our nurses, they feel unvalued uh, because of Bill 124. They, it, it doesn't, our, our hospitals aren't able to increase their wage because of a government that says they can't. They are public service workers. And so we, we um, uh, really struggle with uh, the, the moral injury and feeling unvalued and at a certain point people break and of course they do and they break in two ways one of them they've come they're more cynical they're um, they're they're uh, hardened and they try their best to be the person they want to be at the patient's bedside but they're not happy and that's not okay and that affects patient care and the second is they leave uh, and you why wouldn't you Caroline, you mentioned Bill 124. Just to put it on the record, CMG, the union which represents some TVO employees, is part of the lawsuit against Bill 124. 
the, recently, the Ontario Liberal Party released a leaked document showing emergency room wait times are getting worse, as Colin DeMello reported for Global News in October. Um, in August, the majority of patients who were transported to a hospital in an ambulance were forced to wait up to 83 minutes to be offloaded and taken inside the emergency room. This, the report says, is a 40.7% increase from the same period in 2021. I want to ask you both this question. Alan, I'll start with you. How do you treat patients if you can't find beds for them? Yeah, uh, that's a problem. And uh, I think it's fairly safe to say that the idea of uh, privacy and confidentiality, one of the hallmarks uh, of the practice of medicine, has frankly gone out the window. Uh, the choice is very clear. You know, you present the emergency department, all of our stretchers are occupied, will be occupied for hours. Uh, ambulance is unable to offload, so spending time in hallways. So now the care. Is, uh, is delivered in, you know, the government frames it unconventional spaces. Let me be clear. Uh, it's delivered in hallways. It's delivered in waiting rooms. It's delivered in closets. It's delivered, uh, frankly, in toilets. It's practically getting that bad. And so we see people and I say, you know what? I've got no place to see you. So the only other option is I'm going to see you in this uh, private, this not a private, a very public space with no privacy, no confidentiality whatsoever. Uh, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's beyond my control. The only other option for you is to wait four hours or five hours for me to finally be able to find a private stretcher for you or a private chair somewhere um, so you can be seen. And it's just, uh, and, and patients have now sort of normalized that and they've accepted that, you know, no, they don't want to wait five, six, eight hours. And so they're willing to accept uh, that lack of privacy and confidentiality, but they shouldn't. Um, Alan, you mentioned hallways, and I should just say, uh, just to out of fairness, I think uh, the government will probably say that this is hallway medicine, as it's called, uh, has been something that's been happening in this province, uh, even when the last government, the Liberal government with Kathleen Wynne. Um, for you, Caroline, okay, but excuse the, me, hmm? excuse me, excuse me, but fair enough, hmm. uh, and 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 that is true. Uh, but here's the reality: you know, our premier, Mr. Ford, uh, during the last um, uh, government promised to end hallway medicine, promised, uh, and really didn't address it whatsoever. It was uh, everything but what he needed to do, which is increase hospital bed capacity and increase bed capacity within the community. So, you know, I, I, I get that he loves blaming Kathleen Wynne and Dalton McGinty for all the sins of, of, of the medical system, but he's now a second term premier um, and has promised to uh, and hallway medicine to provide, to keep hospitals open uh, most recently. And on both of those promises uh, has failed miserably. So he actually, it's time for this conservative government, and I am a, a progressive conservative, it's time for his government to own it. Okay, Carolyn, I have the same yeah. question for you. How do you treat patients if you don't have beds? So very similar uh, to, to Alan, I, I will say our organization is really trying to look at the concept of equity of care across the entire organization. So how do we make sure that the patient in our emergency department is getting the same kind of care that somebody who's already up in a room? And we're really trying to understand how we can change our, our processes to do that, because I think that's a really important fundamental concept in healthcare. Um, but when that's not possible, and that isn't possible often, we do similar things that, that Alan is. Uh, we look and we sort of say, okay, the person's blood work's already back. We know they're vitally stable. So I'm going to take a little corner where there's a recliner chair and I'm going to put a, a divider up and I'm going to go in there and I'm going to do a quick exam there and I'm going to have the conversation and they never get to an actual emergency department bed during their time. So we look and who's waiting, who can we do that with, how can we try to to, to at least uh, care for those that can, are still able to stand and walk to a space. And so we do it that way. Sometimes we're in hallways on them, ambulance stretchers. We work really hard to get our ambulance colleagues, our paramedics back on the street because they're needed out there. Uh, and, and yet it's extremely difficult when we're working for the limited resources. We reached out to the Ontario Ministry of Health for comment. They sent us a statement which reads in part, the plan, which is called our plan to stay open, uh, health system stability and recovery ensures that Ontarians will continue to have access to the care they need when they need it. 
Once fully implemented, the next phase of the plan to stay open will add up to 6,000 more healthcare workers, including nurses and personal support workers, to Ontario's health workforce will free up to over 2,500 hospital beds so that care is there for those who need it and will expand models of care that provide better, more appropriate care to avoid unnecessary visits to emergency departments. Um, we're running out of time and um, with that statement. Uh, that's only part of the statement. Um, the ministry also says that other provinces as a country are also experiencing similar challenges that Ontario is facing right now. What is your response to that statement? Alan, I'll start with you. Well, first of all, there is an absolute lack of urgency. Uh, yes, we have problems, uh, but the problems are going to get substantially worse uh, if we see this sort of confluence of influenza and COVID. So their plan about increasing healthcare workers and beds over a longer term, you know, frankly, doesn't cut it. We're going to be in a problem. Those field hospitals that were dragged out in the first part of the COVID pandemic, I hope they haven't been put, put too deep into the storage bins because we're going to need them. So what they really need to do is stop the hemorrhaging of nurses, stop the bleeding of nurses leaving the emergency department, repeal this crazy bill that seems to be so inflammatory, and get our nurses back to work. Second of all, to look at hospital capacity to get it to a safe occupancy level of 85 percent not try to make us function in the hospitals that are frankly overcrowded you know at 100 120 percent routinely so uh there there needs to be the urgency it's been sadly lacking it's been a desultory response to a crisis in healthcare, um, and frankly ontarians deserve a lot better and carolyn i don't have anything more to add okay well i i have time for one more question okay, great um because i think we're people trying to find solutions right. throughout the pandemic public health measures were introduced to help to avoid hospitals being overwhelmed as it stands now pediatric hospitals are so overwhelmed that ontario hospitals have been asked to admit teenage patients to uh, admit um, to adult icus dr kieran moore says that he might re revisit masking in some places within two weeks to address some of the challenges we're seeing now what needs to be done today to avoid a tomorrow where more ERs are closed? Carolyn? We absolutely need to reinstitute masking right now in, in, in public spaces. Uh, I think with new waves of new variants coming and flu having been here since uh, for a few weeks, I think uh, I've heard that last week it was, I believe, a 3% of positive uh, swabs. Now we're up to 11% this week alone. Flu is here. And, and RSV is here, and they are filling our ICUs. And, and uh, I, I'm very concerned. So masking is effective. We've seen this. We know it works, and that needs to happen. And Alan, you've got 30 seconds. Uh, get your immunizations up to date, both Absolutely. respect with uh, influenza as well as uh, uh, make sure your COVID boosters are, are up to date. That is going to be the, the key, I think, to keeping people uh, out of the hospital and, and preventing us from having this slow descent into medical hell. And as of November 1st, I think everyone in the province is eligible. Um, Alan and Carolyn, thank you so much for your time. We really do appreciate your insights and all the work that you're doing to keep Ontarians safe. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.